will say welcome to everybody. Um, I've got a short list of program procedures that I have to run through, and I'm sorry, but um, it should only take a minute. Uh, the Friends of the Edgewater Library welcome you to today's virtual program, Poetry at Home. Although the library remains closed, uh, the Friends mission remains the same, which is supporting the library, its staff, and its programming by raising supplemental funds and promoting the library as a vital resource in our community. We're excited to be able to offer programs via Zoom because it helps you all stay connected to our library family during the closures. One of the ways we're able to continue programs is through your generous gifts of membership dues, donations, and sponsorships. If you're interested in helping the friends and the library for as little as $10 a year, please visit our website for more information about how you can participate in our organization. Our web address will soon appear in the chat box. Before we begin, here are the procedures. Um, if you have a cell phone nearby, could you please turn it off or silence it while attending the event? And turning to your Zoom app or the website, please click on the chat bubble to open the chat bar. This is where we will communicate with you during the course of the presentation and where you can contact us if you have any issues. Please watch for notices. You'll see as you open it now, we have posted, we have posted purchase information, I just did that right now, for today's author's books, as well as the Friends of the Edgewater Library uh, web address, and that's coming. Um, we will be recording this program for playback on the Friends website. By registering, you have given Friends of the Edgewater Library permission to use your image and voice when applicable as a part of the recording and its future use online. At the start of all programs, Friends of the Edgewater Library will mute you. This courtesy eliminates audio and video interruptions to our programs. We will unmute you whenever there is a need to do so. Our guest speakers will take questions at the end of today's talk. Please type your question into the chat box and hit enter to send the question and I will ask the questions on your behalf. Lastly, we will post a program evaluation poll immediately after we open the Q&A portion. We would appreciate if everyone could take a few seconds to answer three very brief multiple choice questions while you're listening to the, to the poet's answer. Now, that's all the business, and with that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce today's po program, Poetry at Home. Last month during National Poetry Month, the Academy of American Poets at poets.org launched an initiative called Hashtag Shelter in Poems. Their reason for doing so was to highlight poetry's unique ability to offer, and I quote, courage, solace, and actionable energy. Three qualities everyone staying at home right now during the pandemic surely and sorely need. As Ken Taylor, one of our speakers today put it, people turn to poetry for the big events, weddings, funerals, courtship, pandemics. The reader or listener completes the job by lifting what's been taken into a place that may not have been intended, but is no less real or wondrous. And what's better than that when you're stuck at home? And I'm confident today in saying that the best thing when we're at home is having three wonderful poets join us in your living spaces and perhaps take our minds off our worries and stir our souls for the time we're with when we're together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the three writers we have who make today's program possible. And poets, please, if you have your books handy, please hold up one of your books as you're introduced. We have Ken Taylor, who is a Chicago resident, a poet, publisher with Selva Oscura Press, and co-founder and contributing editor of Loot and Drum, an online journal of poetry and poetics. We have J. Peter Moore, Pete, who is a poet, literary critic, and editor. He lives in Indiana and teaches at Purdue University. And lastly, we have Magdalena Zorowski, or Maggie, who is an award-winning poet, author of the novel, The Bruise, and associate professor of English and creative writing at the University of Georgia, where she directs the creative writing program. These introductions are bare bones because we're going to start today's program with something fun by having the three poets introduce each other. So you three met through Duke University and you've known each other for a while. So please take a turn picking one of your fellow poets and introducing that person in a little more depth. And each poet, after you've finished, please read us one of your poems that you think will help us know a little bit more about who you are. Mm. Going first. Would like to go first. <laughs> well, I, well, 
Who wants to go first? Anyone? I'll go first. I'll introduce Pete. Oh. Pete. <laughs> Pete is the guy who saved, um, well, what should I say? When I was uh, in Durham, I was uh, running a, a reading series when I was a graduate s student called the Minor American Reading Series. And it's actually how I m well, got to know Pete better and um, met Ken. Can I introduce them both? Can I just tell you our origin yeah. story yeah. as superheroes? That'd be great. Yeah, um, go for it. So Pete and I, well, I was running this series before Pete got to town and then because Pete started the program a couple of years after I did. And um, and the person that I was running it with wasn't really helping me. That's all I'll just say. And so I asked Pete to help me and Pete was, um, well, he would write like five page introductions to the poets and be very diligent. Meanwhile, I would just roll in with half a bottle of whiskey in like three sentences and, and it worked. <laughs> and then one we day- were the, We were the Kobe and Shaq of uh, a <laughs> very low attended university sponsored poetry reading series. Yes, yes, basically. <laughs> basically we were a welfare program for poets. It was really great. But one day, one day Pete's, did you study with DA Powell, Pete? Or you know DA from? Yeah, I studied with him friends. Yeah, a long time yeah. for, uh, probably so, I met him when I was, uh, I think, 19, 20. So, yeah, so Pete, for, Pete for scored us DA Powell for a reading. And lo and behold, this guy with a beard walks in and we've never seen before into our 10 person audience. And it turns out that he saw DA Powell's tweet that he was reading at Duke. And that's when Ken joined the crew. And then we were just, we just had this big posse of secret poets in the PhD program. Everyone was pretending to do things like write essays, but what was Tuesday night, um, late nights in that classroom where we were drinking whiskey and reading each other's poems. Yeah, but that the day, the day, the new reading circle. Mm -hmm. That was, that was pretty great. Anyhow, that's how we knew each other. Anyhow, he has a book and so does Ken. Uh, is that an introduction? I don't know. It's a great introduction. Pete, would you like to read something? Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to read one thing, but uh, I'll read another. Um, I, was gonna read <laughs> <laughs> I had this poem that I've never read before, and I'll probably never publish, but it's something that I always have in my head, and I was going to start with that. But because Maggie started with that story, that kind of origin story, um, I'll pick up on that same narrative. We had a reading series and it was the night that Ken showed up. Uh, I was reading with D.A. Powell. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but it was cool outside. I think it was like October. Um, and I was working on an, uh, a manuscript that became this book, Southern Color Type. And it was essentially, a, my, my father worked as a, a printer for about, 40 years. He got the job when he was 17 out of high school. Uh, this is a kind of industrial print shop and it's pretty small. It was in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was uh, the last employee. They uh, shuttered after uh, the recession in 2009. And I had worked there in summers and throughout adolescence. And uh, I kind of just had this long funeral dirge for the factory and all the people who worked there. And so that night I, I ended on the poem that I'll start with today and it's called Reciprocal Ohm. And it, it, it starts dealing with the mythology of that place. The next voice you hear cannot be distinguished from the page preceding this one. I left work to look at factory windows burned daylight into black hatched channels and have the talk with my father repeat against their fevered silt. From the page preceding this one, I left work out of reach, out of breath, out of breast pocket. I lifted the smoldering weight of a notepad plowed over with sap second thoughts and strike throughs, striking through to what the elegy is a clutched hush. To look at these factory windows burn daylight, you wouldn't believe that behind each vacant flicker rooms remain where we composed like them invisibly began 
large enough in our skin to cast astonishment onto the mismanagement of grief. Where Jericho falls into black hatched channels, we have talked the night away with Willie Dale, who was let go from the plant before my father and comes up to us at a car show, unlettered with word. You won't believe it, Randy. They hired me to walk the lots at the outlet mall. With my father repeating against their fevered silt, Willie Dale beat to death by his heart weeks later, slumped over between two cars, died while the security camera caught it all. While what was not bolted down, my father drug up, dug up, drug off on the dying company's dime. The next voice you hear cannot be distinguished from the page preceding this one. It is all second thought and ballpoint strike through, striking through to what? Each day is a tearing down to the drains, forces out of our control, I tell you, out of our hands. This, America, is where we invisibly began. Composed in skin that has clutched the lull and wake of industrial cremains, this is where Jericho falls and the voice is bolted down to what the security camera saw, to what my father dug up and drug off with his words. You spend your life working on the train. You talk to the train. You care about the train. Then someone tells you there's no place to go and you could just as soon reach out and touch the months. Lovely, thank you. Would you like to take a turn now and introduce one of your fellow poets? Yeah, um, I will, I'll take Ken. Um, so Ken showed up that night and uh, we had a reading group. Part of the working group that we were so, it, well, it was a reading series, but it was also a working group. And uh, what that meant is that we got a little bit of money to buy Indian food and meet at uh, Faculty House, uh, Priscilla Wald and Joe Donahue, um, big ups to both of them. Uh, and they hosted, you know, pretty much monthly, bi-monthly meetings. And we would read a contemporary poet and in, 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 in in a kind of classical canonical work at the same time. And, you know, lots of people will say, yeah, I'll show up. It'd be cool. That sounds really cool what you were doing. And then you get like six or seven people and you, you're happy with that. But Ken, who had no explicit connection with the university, lived uh, what I took to be 45 minutes away. He'll tell you he lived 30 minutes away, but I, I've driven it many times and it was 45. Um, he would come and he just, he started coming religiously. He, he, he became like he became the deacon of the secular church that was the, the, uh, the working group. And uh, he would read before he showed up and he was like totally prepared with notes. And then I told him some stuff that I was working on and uh, for my dissertation. And he was like, I'll read that with you. And we just started meeting and reading uh, the work of this poet named Charles Olson. And I, you know, I hate this, you know, it's this kind of uh, schmaltzy, but he became my best friend. Uh, we met all the time. We talked. It, it moved outside of the realm of uh, literary matters into, you know, he, he's, he's helped me kind of grow up. Um, and he, the thing that's been so amazing is Ken had this kind of innate interest in language before he showed up with our group. Uh, he had taken, I think, some classes in college when he was at Auburn. And then he went and led this really incredibly interesting life where he was uh, an actor, a juggler, a private investigator. I mean, there's a noir film out there, I'm sure, um, with, with, you know, Ken is the starring, starring lead. But he, he was able, like, you would think someone with this incredibly interesting life would come in and write these very narrative confessional poems about things that he saw on the job. But they weren't. They were these very uh, intricate, uh, melodic structures of sound and sense. And it was just kind of like, this innate avant-garde. Uh, and um, we, we really hit it off. And I've been able to watch his, his poetry develop and take shape over the last almost 10 years. And it's been just amazing, you know? Um, so uh, it was, I, you know, I used to think that we, that, that the poetry working group, you know, kind of 
made it possible for like what was this like integral part for Kim but I, now I realize that you know we just we just lucked out to find him and that he was doing this he was going to be doing this kind of crazy stuff no matter where he was at and uh it's been really uh, rewarding to see it take shape that's that's really great now I'm I'm really looking forward to hear one of Ken's avant-garde or not avant-garde poems. So if you'd like well, to share know, something, that'd be great. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can live up to all that, but that was a very nice feat. Beautiful. It's, it, to me, it was like symbiosis, actually, and the symbiosis in the way that David Mamet describes it between the ducks and the blue herons in the in a place called in a play called the Duck Variations, and it's something like it's what they call symbiosis. The blue herons eat ducks, and the ducks' part of the bargain is to well, I forget it for the moment, but it's not as one-sided as it might appear. <laughs> so I'm the duck. I'm the duck in the blue heron space. Um, so this is, I'm going to read something from an old, something I was working on a few years ago that I abandoned because these characters kept showing up in it and I didn't know what to do with it. I went and wrote something else and then I had a better way of kind of figuring out how to deal with them. And it's kind of a meta theater piece. In fact, there's a one act play in the middle of it. Um, but this first poem is called Dram Dramatis Personae, and so the characters will introduce themselves. So that's, I'll let them introduce themselves. Governed by fascination, deliberately out of sync, I am the speaker in the poem, as evidence of formal deciding, like 36 ethyls collecting, blurring, patterning, patina of a zero lot line, horns of many goats, positing the emergence of new, Logic of assembly, passcode loyalist, Lindy Tuck in turn. Plying my story, not the poets, who can't help but sometimes hold the pen. First person, third person, if a mouth falls alone in the woods, does it say, not I? Hmm. We are servants of God, or a hockey team from Tracy, California and appear to act en masse with emotion described by non-inertial framing, assuming Newton's second in our pretend. We travel curves at a steady pace, not anywhere near ice time, stamped to dance and sing like mad Athenians devoted to our culture, gulp of swallows, scream of swifts, chime of wrens, corral bound for the all fictitious finals. I am a red fox interfacing with optically charged fields like a twice dropped pocket square double grandfathered in. Attic tragic resplendent assassin screened at silent speed, antinomian trading in old world birds for their capacities and currents in duck blood for its savory potentials approaching lamb. More swords in the deck, almost always never seen erasing but striking like a promise of treble damage. We are X, pronouns, fierce, otherist, they. Buried treasure, illiterate signature, recital-ready, Christ-like itinerant in case and cadence with irregular living, unknown integer, tightly cropped Cleopatra as empty working rented paper, New moon plus a red dress and a choice. Embellishing, embellishment preceding another and taking a portion of its voice, turning from twink to butch in a flash. Special pace, ignore all, numerous, numinous, in a fluid situation no weir can hold. This is our dream. Thank you. Now you've Potter's there, huh? So, yeah. <laughs> among among other things, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's your turn now to introduce Maggie. That's we'd all like so, to learn a little bit more about her. So on that fateful night at at the Duke reading series, it was in the uh, women's study building in Duke, and it's a room that. So I I, I didn't it's know that I could parlor. go. Yeah, the parlor, sorry. I didn't know I could actually go to Duke and attend a poetry ring, so I was grateful that I was able to do that. And I get there, and it's this room with these overstuffed chairs and these matrons on the wall, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be, I don't know what this is going to be. 
And then Maggie turned to me and handed me a can of beer, offered me a can of beer. And I think it was passed. And I was like, this changes everything, basically. And um, she and Pete, like they said, ran this reading series. They were so kind to let me be involved. Um, I've learned so much about them. Maggie is uh, busy trying to make sure people do write in this world, and I'm very proud of her for that. And um, I'll let her poetry speak for who and what she is, et cetera. All right, well, um, you had a goat. I wasn't, this isn't what I would thought I was gonna read, but um, because of your goat, I'm gonna read a, an old poem, which is from a book that I was writing when we were meeting in that group. Um, Final Valentine. I felt sure that together you and I might be an example of something beautiful. And on a spring day that was really only mid-February, we celebrated ourselves too soon. I walked into a barn and let the baby goats suck my fingers until they bled. It's instinct to cry when the skin breaks. You stared with the other agricultural tourists who had also assented to the liability clause. If the chickens knew anything they didn't say, a cow named Blackie followed the children like a dog. Later, they ate him. So I was a bit shorter. <laughs> that was, that's from one for our meetings, no? That came in. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that's that. That ended. That was, that was an ending. So how, yeah. do you, how do you begin a poem? How do you begin a poem like that or any of your poems? Where do your ideas come from? A late call answer. Um, uh, it depends. Um, like this book that just came out last year um, started kind of by accident. Um, I have a prop. I had this extra copy of this book and I was having a lot of writer's block. So um, there was someone online, a poet, Joe Massey, who was showing his beautiful whited out Shakespeare sonnets. He was making new sonnets out of, or new poems out of the Shakespeare sonnets by whiting them out. So I started doing that mm. to this. Um, and I'm not very good at, I'll t I always tell myself, um, okay, I'm gonna white out the whole book and this is how I'm gonna write it. But then I end up just breaking the rules and then at night, I would sometimes just scribble. I would make new uh, sentences or, or lines out of the poem in the margins and stuff, and that would um, accumulate. They would accumulate and become poems like that. So I often write off of other writing, um, uh, but the only true, yeah. But only one of the poems, uh, one of the poems in this book, turned out to be a, a perfect whiteout whited out poem that I that ended up in the book the rest are sort of like collaged pieces of that so that's often how I start poems read us one. Oh, okay I'll read that one then the one that came out it has a bad word in it <laughs> not my fault it was in the book um, island pill you are surely lost the waiting room is teeming with pigeons your birthday cake takes off and eats some horse. Here, take this pill. It knows Vladimir. It knows communists of all nations. It says kids everywhere love life and intend to love life beyond music, beyond breath. If the Russian comes by at midnight in the rain, just say, hey, Vlad. Poets are assholes, tender lambs of electricity. They have mouths of mind open to the tone-deaf wind and a sweet smack of, ah, thanks, I needed that. Their hearts shine pure with the moon and swim to Satin Island, true as midnight sky pollution. Oh, to have birds cooing, bells ringing, tofu frying, and unusually high energy levels. To feel that stealthy familiar of a new poem coming up mechanical on the clank machine. It carries you through a wall. It knows just what you mean. So that, that one is just made up of words that, well, I guess all, just words. Words I took from another place. Hmm. 
I, I tell it to my students all the time. I was like, you don't have to have great ideas. You just have to know how to take other people's words and re, um, what is it that the DJs do? Steal. Remix them. Remix them. Remix them. Yeah. What about you, Ken? That's my remix of Brody. That's great. Nice. Um, so, I don't know. I, I write, I, ca I carry a little notebook around and I write down impressions, I guess, or impulses. And, and then something generates uh, some momentum to start putting them together. Other times, um, I'll be in bed. It's one of my favorite things to do before I get up when you're kind of help when you're kind of between wake and sleep and just things flow and sometimes things can come fully formed. So it just depends, different thing. Um, I can read one that I got from Instagram. Uh, it's uh, a phrase I see all the time, hashtag no filter. That's the uh, title of this one. Um, and I just think it's a, a misnomer because there's so many filters between when you look at an image and by the time it's rendered on social media. So I started thinking about that and I created a poem. So hashtag no filter. Chasing light is trying to grasp aromatic collapsing by the eyes of X, each eye seeing from a different angle. Through the gain of pupils and squinch of irises, through the change of mirrors in each eye, through retinas turning receptions to impulses, through optic nerves, through the lens, through zeros and ones, through the fur coat remix of the bitmap grid, through values of stroke, shape, curve, thickness, fill, death, plate of food, sunset. Through reducing continuous time signals to a discrete time signal, through the charisma of the app, through pressure over fiber under ocean, through routing and switching, through servers, through naming protocols, through the broth of metadata. Once removed from experience, removed again by captioning, removed again with dispersal by friends and the friends of friends, through traffic capture and the glistening of its bowers, through security settings, ad placement, file sharing, through beams delivered from towers, sometimes dressed as trees, through coded themes rendering images to understanding, through the smallest addressable elements in an all points addressable display, through the arpeggiated feature of moving, emptying, craving, delivering the money shot from a blank horizon. Thank you. How about you, Pete? Where do your ideas come from and how do you, how do you begin your work? Uh, it's changed. I mean, the, the, the book that I that was reading from first, so much of that grew out of uh, conversation with other artists. Like there are so many of those poems in the poems, there's a discussion of workshopping the poem with other people in the community. Uh, like someone's suggestion for what the piece should do that enters into content of the work. Um, and then, you know, uh, here recently stuff has moved more isolated. You know, uh, there haven't, hasn't been as much of a vibrant community around me. And so I think now what tends to excite me most is like projects. Um, I don't, uh, it, it's, it, it's hard for me to collect or have the kind of patience or focus to sit down and write what people call like occasional verse or like a poem just hits you. There's like a line. Um, so mine have, you know, my projects to have like an arc to them. And um, so the piece, um, the, this book, Zippers and Jeans, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a narrative. It's like three people with essays inter, interspersed. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I always had it in my mind as like a, like a clothesline. And like, I didn't need the narrative to be uh, the thing that was driving everything, but I felt like I could put anything I wanted to within the narrative. I could hang anything on that line and it would somehow uh, create a shape. And that gave me a sense of confidence going forward. And, and uh, um, that was important. So I'll read the, the first line, the, the first poem that kind of 
sets in place the narrative um, of kind of doomed romance. Uh, when, when, you know, you could think about this uh, within a kind of courtly love tradition. Uh, it's called The Sky Slash Heaven Over Memphis. Every time a man walks into a bar, an angel gets an eye exam. Dehydrated in the days counting down to our breakup, I fall asleep watching Wings of Desire and wake up with a charley horse the size of West Germany. A man repossessed by his muscles, I stagger into the kitchen and drink the juice from a jar of pickles, each spear eaten by the love of my life. The brine shines my chin. The angel, Damiel, hears human thought take shape like a pen never leaving the page and trades immortal tele telepathy for a glass of empty calories and love. If these walls could talk, my life would be an inside joke. Nice. It is nice. Thank you. Can I just um, have you go back to the first poem you read? Can you give us the title? Somebody asked me if, if you could repeat the title of that first one you read about the factory. Oh, the book is Southern Color Type, and that poem is called Reciprocal Ohm. Okay. Uh, R-E-C-I-P-R-O-C-A-L-O-H-M. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, I'm going to pivot a little bit and um, talk about uh, your your career is outside of your poetry. Um, in addition to being poet, you each have different roles. Um, Ken, you're an editor, Maggie, an instructor, and Pete, you, you um, are a critic. Do these roles inform your poetry at all? Um, do you look at your own work critically because of the work you do on the outside? Or are you able to sort of have those separate voices, the, the poet voice and then the, the critic voice who comes in later? That's for Pete, or I'll, I guess I can. Start. Uh, whoever wants to start. Oh uh, well, like yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I started taking up like longer projects was just because I was starting to see the poem as a space where it wasn't um, built for ex uh, expression but for study, and um, that it was a it was a place of informal study. Um, and that you did, it was, it, it, that was what the poem was for me. And so there were all these ways in which things that I was, were, were, was digging into for kind of peer reviewed journal publication or, you know, like, uh, conference paper or whatever, uh, would spill into the poems and they would kind of feed one another. And, uh, I would take them on a different, another path. Um, like one example, uh, that's in here, uh, it's called... Uh, death mask of the dead lecturer and the dead lecturer is like a uh, like not to over explain stuff but that's just uh that's that's a title of a book by Mary Baraka and he had died oh uh, probably a month before I wrote this and uh there's this great poem like when I think about like what's the critic's job in literary criticism and I don't think it's like one thing or ever single and I, and I would never feel qualified to answer what it was, but there's this great passage um, from Frank O'Hara, the poet. And he essentially, you know, he says that the, that, the, that, the, that the critic's job is to make the poet live forever and that to be the poet's friend and to, you, you know, you can't assassinate my orchards, he says, right? And so I feel like what I'm trying to do in this poem is uh, keep Baraka alive. And I feel like that's on the best days, any kind of scholarship that I write, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not dissect anything. It's just kind of um, perpetuate something that was a gift to me. Um, so this is a poem about Baraka or of Baraka in, in salute to Baraka. And it was actually, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, one. The death mask of the dead lecturer is plaster of Paris poured through mimeo stencils, cocktail napkins from mittens fringe the jowls, affixed at one end, the gauze hangs loosely, dancing some bright eloquence of 
the sad meat of the body made. Its mouth is one vacant thought bubble pasted over another, the amplifier a raised circle, at its center the gap of going to look for loved objects, only to realize you'd lost them in the move from the village uptown, from Harlem out, from first wife to fornication in the name of hopscotch, truth, and beauty. From one name to the nameless auguries of hate to say this, but hate is the prism through which selfhood tenders itself. The eyes are abstraction disinherited, two lemons cut in two. Two. The wearer of said mask agrees to adopt an irrepressible point of view, as if it were a particular gait recognizable from afar. Said mask, loud and intoxicating in its pretense, will ironically teach said wearer a great deal about silence. Said wearer will stride with said silence across remote mountain towns, diesel smell picked up on the air as buses arrive, delivering pilgrims who spend the night fingerprinting the forest with their flashlights. The whole eye will become a corner out of which said wearer will see little groups of sh little groups shuffling through the temporary plaza, climbing through the unfinished corridors of the new buildings where they will sleep on particle board and fiddle with faucets that do not pour. Rent poetry gone awry, home happens wherever you hear a break in the burden's weight. Said wearer stays in the street. Three. The once and former wearer hereinafter referred to as such signs the, lot, the dotted line as follows. The mask is in the world where even speech is instrumental. Thank you. Ken, what about you as an editor? How do you, how do you combine those two worlds, editor and poet? Um, I kind of don't really feel like I'm an editor. I mean, I have a press and I published people um, yeah. with um, Fred Moten and I kind of do that. It was, it also has as an imprint three count pour, which Fred and Joe Donahue helped start. Um, I feel like I, I have impulses about how I would do something and maybe I share those sorts of things and maybe that's helpful, but I don't really consider myself an editor, I guess. So, um, I do a lot of other stuff that don't have, don't have anything doesn't have anything to do with literary things, but um, mm -hmm. um, I don't have a poem that will segue easily into that. But I can read a poem. Read a poem. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is still from I, I didn't tell tell you what the title of that project I was doing, but it was called Variations in the Dream of X. So of all those characters I read, the uh, X is kind of the main character. Uh, so here's another poem. From that, it's called Two Tall Blondes with Room. Sure, X wants to save the planet, but they don't want to scald their flesh, walking Joe back to the rendezvous. Someone didn't take full measure of the sidewalk, or maybe it's all this gum composing no world outside of poetry. A guest staying above adjusts the drape of her dress, smooths kick pleats by a task light to hide access. Does anyone practice care these days? Or do they source demolished and decommissioned in a style that casts no shadow? Drama is someone speaking back in a word list that demands listening and not the most relatable thing, hustling story before candles go out. Busy buzzing many nectars in absence that aches to be before or after, hidden within to own every third bite of food who X deems to go to bed with or who they go to bed as is no one's beeswax. Maggie, wow. how about you? I hope that's not about your editing. <laughs> <Sure. Yeah. laughs> uh, me? Oh, uh, well, I really get a lot out of teaching, especially undergraduates. I'm really um, grateful for that. Um, but it's also a frustrating to be uh, in a university system now and see how resources are being taken away from the humanities and put towards so-called practical things. Um, so I feel like that's been something 
uh, that started creeping into my work in my last book uh, mm-hmm. and in the projects that I'm working on now, um, that that's really becoming the, the focus. Mm-hmm. So um, in both poetry and essays, um, and I could read, um, I guess the, the first poem, a, a first section of a longer poem where that first became pretty explicit um, as the uh, subject matter of the poem. If you studied business in school, you studied rules and principles. You learned that biz- business is work done by animals. A team of horses will thresh 300 bushels a day, and even one horse with a $25 machine can be good business. A horse that eats only a moderate quantity of food will do as much business as one that eats continually. And men hired to mend harnesses must be kept busy mending harnesses if you are to do good business. A supervisor needs no experience. He must only consult analyze and explain the beauty of business is that there are many animals to do it for you. Should you not care for horses, several pharmacists will fill prescriptions all day long and several doctors will write prescriptions for every patient. Even a pecan farm, if supervised correctly, can be good business as long as Billy drives the shaker through the orchard once the shuck has split and Jim sweeps the fallen nuts into windrows and the harvesters follow to load the nuts into wagons. Make sure your grade B nuts are separated out by quality control. Mammoth pecans can vary a great deal in size from one season to the next. You will know you have supervised nut production well if Gene sends a note stating your packing and shipping is exceptional. Business is work done by animals. All the world is an animal. A good businessman is a zookeeper. You learn this in school. Poetry, however, is something else. That's great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so we've been spending a lot of time reading poems to people who, who are here just to specifically listen. What, what experience do you hope they take away? Or what do you, do you write a poem with the intention of giving someone a certain experience? I want to control their minds. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, adoration, oh. money, all that stuff. Love. Does anybody want to take this? I mean, part? I don't. I don't know about. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to make them do or feel. I guess. Um, I guess just uh, inviting them to share. And what I'm doing. See if see if it's something that's interesting to them and see if it's something they enjoy spending time with. Mm-hmm. I feel like most people don't want to spend that time, but the, the ones that do, or you, you share something there. I mean, I would say that what I like about poetry or why I want to participate in poetry uh, is that it allows for different kinds of social spaces to open up, meaning, um, that in the way that we interact each o- with each other on daily basis, we were sort of restricted to certain kinds of talk or thoughts, um, you know, but just even the story of, of Ken walking into the room when Pete and I were running a reading series, um, you know, this whole, this whole circle of, of people coalesced around there and um, we were able to, you know, meet in the evenings and read each other's work and have conversations about things um, that were important to us that aren't necessarily things that people talk about. So, yeah, there's. Uh, it just came to me like so. There was this. Uh, if, if we're thinking about the the space out of which the milieu out of which our kind of friendship emerged, uh, we all kind of had. Uh, connection to this poet, theorist, and critic named Fred Moten, and he has this great he has this great thing where he writes in the book in the break. Uh, Andrew Ross was this critic who talks about the poet Frank O'Hara going to the five spot to see Billie Holiday sing, which he writes about in a poem, and he kind of talks about it within like the 
the, the, the language of the, the hipster, the interloper, the white interloper going to look for some sort of uh, uh, authentic other um, in this, uh, you know, other space, this exoticized space. And like, there's this, this sense that you get in Fred's writing where he's like, well, the thing that Ross doesn't take into consideration is that uh, O'Hara is a poet. And that there's this way in which poetry brings people from various different backgrounds and um, from very just various different contexts into uh, relation with one another. And I think that's kind of what Maggie's talking about there. And it's been doing it for a very long time. And uh, I agree, that's one of the things that, it's, it's always, this, like the writing of the poem and the ordering of the Indian food for poets to get together seems like the same act to me. Like they seem like totally the same act. Like that the, both of those things are making possible uh, uh, the study of poetry and the perpetuation of poetry. Yeah, we had, we used to also meet at a place, the name of the bar is called Surf Club, and we had this thing called Surf Club for a while in Durham, which was great. And it was ad hoc, and people would bring poems, but op oftentimes, I mean, we may get to the poems, and oftentimes we did, and there was a lot of sharing there. There were other times where we almost had fist fights. And I never had did. almost a fist fight. Oh, we well, I, I, <laughs> there, there were times when we had to separate people, but it, you know, there was just some stuff that got worked out, but there was also <laughs> just, a, I mean, you know, but there was also, no, nobody left mad, but um, sometimes they came mad, and uh, so it was great. It was, it was very generative for both poetry and our relationships, I felt. And we're trying to kind of, we've actually started trying to resurrect that again online. It's not quite the same, but. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really, uh, this, this opportunity to read with each other made me think about how much I miss that now that we had this kind of natural community happening. And when you're, you know, do it, when you are an academic, you get sent somewhere and that, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen in the new place. Right. I feel like the people, the friends that I talk to about poetry the most here are my students, you know, and it's not quite the same. Um, I mean, it's really rewarding and um, I learn a lot, but it's a, it's, it's a totally different experience, you know. Um, yeah, that was what, that, yeah, that was what was cool about Surf Club and those reading places. It was a safe space to expose yourself and try things. It wasn't a workshop. People weren't breaking each other's things down. It was very encouraging. People found People, people express what they got out of the poem, which is, which is kind of what you were talking about before, what you hope to connect with people. And that happened a lot. But Fred just posted in the chat, poetry will make you fight. So there's that. <laughs> well, you've all sort of touched upon a point where, that I was going to make in my last question, which was, can you talk about how you help each other with your work? And I think you've talked a lot about um, the community that you build together as poets. Um, if you want to say anything more about that, or we could just, we've got a few more minutes. Um, we could just lead into one final poem. And then I've got a bunch of questions that people have been asking and a couple of comments that I want to share with you. So if you'd like to either say something more about your writing community um, and then leave with your final poem, that would be great. Um, I'll, just, I'll just read my final poem because I think we talked about our community. We could talk about that for a while. Yeah. So uh, this is um, this is uh, actually a monologue at the end of the play that's in the middle of my project, and it's the hockey team at the end of the play having this monologue. And um, it's a non sequitur, so I won't ruin the play for you if you ever get to read it. Um, so the hockey team says, for what is hockey except a word of unknown origin defining a contact sport where two teams on skates exchange the vulcanized rubber puck? The area of opposition approximating circular and thrust into seeing is 10,000 plus frozen gallons X feet long and X feet wide with lines, dots, circles, creases, all encased in boards. The rink, the goals, face-offs, sin bins, Zamboni driver transforming uneven to suave and fresh resurfacing, shaving, watering, leaving safeness, steering clear of enclosing, 
external to the purview of consent. But we digress. And while this may be admired in Nordic climes and frost covered elsewheres, why can't there be a club in Tracy, California, if there is vision and faith in restoring some fallen place like Altamont, where other angels failed to situate dance? There are three periods in a hockey game, which is Aristotelian in theatrical structure. There are six on a side, and as beautiful as that may be, why not up the game with flourishing, with unruly dithyrams urging irregular straining like banqueters run amok, no call to action, no expected change, no charting dramatic questioning. This is interloper business that follows its own winding, sometimes lifted by Theoria, by inside joy that adds folding in a kind of ballet no different than every other deeply felt song, no different than praising, immune to what would alter, no matter claims of false pretending or dissembling, no calamity, no breakage, no loss. We know as varied voices, as a unit with distinctions that we possess an excellence beyond notaries and cashiers and palm, and sorry, I can't read this. Between, between notaries and cashiers and polymists, polymists, outside of all capacities past peaking. As a conjured band, we have no true antagonists. We're bigger than statuary and painted terracotta, bigger than reanimating history. And think about skating. It's beyond the surface of ice, beyond melt. Water's low viscosity makes it a poor lubricant. There's a magic, magical loosening layer with unforeseen flow, a mystic intermediate between liquid and ice. We're that choir preaching to ecclesiastics and chorusing to margins with intervals singing of unvarnished truths, enacting the plot arc, arc of bridesmaids to rise on a slippery surface and find purchase, lingering in a measured length of play, disrupting outward and glistening as a way to verging, as a way to forward presence in a projection of more, reveling, collectively contending. Maggie, Pete, if you want to. He wants to go. Yeah. I'll let you finish, Pete. Um, I'm going to read a poem because I'm about to go stake my tomatoes um, when I move this down. So this is called Summer in the Network of Privileged Carports. In my body, there is a death I will always want to forget. I see it up ahead in the clearing of my breath. I'm alive in a yard where I look for life. I find a fawn caught between two posts and call for help. I drive the machine through ivy, take down the privet, don't stall the engine, the blades don't hesitate, but the turf grass won't give up its turf. Like a tired proverb, I sing against the machine, sound a hole and oh in which my heart dwells how I'm wrong wronged and well fed oh to think of the flies and hummingbirds and wasps to think how I have tried to kill the fire ants how I have tried to harm no living thing except the fire ants how I have ignored the diseased retirees who keep the weeds down with roundup how I want the lavender and the foxgloves and lemon tree to live and it is here in all this grunt and feeling that our lived lives expand I take care of the hedges can't keep up with things in the carport the problem of existence is rarely addressed in carports or maybe I should open the fridge take out the mayonnaise, make a sandwich, and shut up. This is life with a butter knife. The soil washes down the hill to the street. There, the sediment of the gutter becomes a rich ground for everything green. The armadillos hide in the mint and pineapple. She's frozen a little bit. She muted. She's up. Yeah. Just oh, unmute. Unmute yourself, back. Megan. Yeah. What happened? You froze and then you muted. So back up. Go back to the oh, I lost my place. 
uh, the bench with, with the broken. Huh? Yeah, you're there. You're good. You're back. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, mint and pineapple. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me find where that was. Uh, okay, the basil and lemon balm are all gnawed, but not the rosemary. The rosemary withstands the heat. The bench with the broken board I fixed for my 43rd birthday. The grill that leaks grease and the mice that feast on the grease and the hose that got nicked. The faucet now capped with a blue plastic bucket. Another fawn rejected by its mother. The fox who stole the neighbor's chicken. The copperhead dead under Clayton's magnolia. I return to the carport with dirt in my shoe and a rash from grazing cukes. Everything I own seems broken even after it's been fixed an old snapper with a severed fuel line seeds for black eyed peas dryer fuzz blown into a gas spot and then di this dish soap salt and white vinegar ready to snuff out any leaf i'd like not to live sorry i don't know what happened this is an imperfect platform sometimes that <laughs> just i think he just froze up a little bit but don't worry about it that was great thank you and Pete, would you like to um, wind yeah. us up with the last poem? Yeah, great. I'll read something that I never, ever, ever, ever read because it comes from a period of my life that I don't relive, relive often. Uh, but uh, it, it is smack dab in the time. It comes from the time that we were all very close to one another geographically. Um, and the poem's title is uh, Lynn Feely. And uh, the, the, the referent there is a, <laughs> is a person who was in our program, uh, a really phenomenal scholar and writer that uh, I lived with for a while. And uh, good things and bad things came out of this, that. But at this point, it was just good things. So we'll, uh, we'll focus on that. And there's a, there's a space in the poem where what I was talking about, the, the kind of community as a shaping force enters in as a kind of prose voice. Lynn Feely. Last we spoke, little rehearsals lined our mouths with a luster stronger than that normal to ink. With more marshaled rhythm, Hakusai's fluent lines have us somewhere between working hard and hardly working, his wave a page hung in mid-hurl. With the luster stronger than that normal to ink, the scratch clean straight through to woodblock, solid speech, letting us in on the hard luck stories objects share. Their trench language, their limits twitch, Maladjusted, we mother tongues with more marshaled rhythm, Hakusai's fluid waves overtake the laboring blank with power. White hands holler back to one another. This draft is smoke from the smell, burnt fuel from the plant. I claim these steps, said to myself. If you ever ask me out on a date, Lynn Feely, I'll answer, does money spend? When first I found myself reading the page preceding this one to a group of writers, including a member who had weeks earlier confessed to having feelings for me, I knew reading a piece that mentions my falling in love with you would cause more injury than I could justify. Still the page vibrated in front of me, brimming with all the work I had put into it, brimming again with all the stress I had let work my eyes into blurry floats of light, leaving the page at night largely illegible to my brain. And now the same page sat there shaking to the beat of a steam engine at a thresher show, an open field in farm country where my father would approach the man who had built the piece of equipment from scrap and they would talk a language of instinct and nimble suspicion, one that I could no more understand than if the engine itself was trying to ask me out on a date. At my father's request, the man would fire up the engine, and though it was tied to no pulley or farm implement, tied to no functional labor, they would watch the engine cycle through its fuel, run rich and shake so wildly it would echo into their speech and well tears into my eyes from the sound kicking broadly against my chest. 
At the Thresher Show, there is no door equal to the heart of God. In front of the writer's circle, your name sat on the page, shaking with intention and torqued hours of unlearning. I could not keep from reading it aloud, but the poem demanded the particular sound of Lynn Feely, which made switching it out with just any word virtually impossible. I started reading the poem, knowing in the back of my mind I had to find some word that would rhyme with Feely, some word that would Robert Creeley. <laughs> if you ever ask me out on a date, Robert Creeley, I'll answer, does money spend? In the wave, there is either beauty or the labor it hides. In the draft, there are only inelegant phrases picked up in native places. Purple bleats my vision, bearing down on soft paper. Walking the streets we put to sleep, I seek you out in storefronts so large none of us could say it was our reflection. The sushi restaurants of my boyhood go boarded up, get them confused with boiled tenements. Still, I will call this place with no sign Kodo. Still, the facade wears the Hakusai mural, blue wave of brick surf pocked with wear, crest scrawling under graffiti. It's not that I don't associate you with labor, Robert Creeley. It's just those little rehearsals you mouth at the break of lines bear a luster stronger than that normal to work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the poems and thank you for the thoughtful answers to the poems, uh, to the questions. And I just want to share uh, a comment that was made, which I think sums up the whole reason for uh, poetry or for writing and writing done well will do this. Um, someone writes here to hear these poets is to see the world, ugliness, beauty, terror through their eyes. And I just want to leave everyone with that thought um, about what good writing can do for you. And at this point, before I go into the audience questions, and I have a few, I'm going to launch the program evaluation poll. Three questions. You can answer them quickly while you're listening to the poets answer their audience questions. So that's all launched. Um, so a couple of things came up on the feed as you were talking. And the first one that came up was, has isolation helped or hindered your writing? Um, and also to follow up on that, if you have been writing poetry in the last few months, have your themes changed? Who would like to start? I would say I've isolation. had a hard time writing. Go ahead. You go ahead. You've had a hard go time, Maggie. Maggie. Oh, I was just going to say, I have a, yeah, yeah, totally. But I always have a hard time writing. Um, yeah, I've had a hard time sitting still. I've, I, I've built like um, huge garden beds, put up a fence, planted all these things, but I can't sit still. So, um, but the last couple of weeks I've started to, to hover around the poetry. So it'll probably happen. Yeah, we just need to make sure we keep the surf club going and we'll spark it. Yeah, 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 that helped. Seeing Ed Roberson. I think, it, I think, you know, being isolated can help, but um, have an effect. So I think just the current situation of the current administration has an effect too. I've seen more, all of that stuff kind of come in more than and what I would like it to, but it's kind of omnipresent. So, yeah, mm. definitely has an effect. And like Maggie said, it's, 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 it's just a lot of stuff going on and trying to keep your spirits up and trying to keep some sort of routine and not, you know, dwell on the doom. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Pete, how about you? Yeah. Reba. Uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm with them. I, 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 I don't think, I, I don't have a problem with sitting in a place, in one place and not doing anything, but the, the whole kind of purpose of it uh, becomes tenuous and um, less apparent to me when there's not a group of people out there to share it with. And um, 
I mean, so much of what I read and what I am interested in are these kind of, or the, the thing I love about poetry is that like, it's never entirely manifested. It's not entirely manifested as an oral act or as a textual act, that it needs both of them in order to happen. And I think um, uh, being isolated has been, been hard for me because I don't, I don't see that, uh, both, both, both of those components. And um, yeah. All right, um, Maggie, there was a question that came up specifically for you, um, and I know you saw it in the chat. Um, how oh, do you, about plagiarizing? Yeah, how do you keep from plagiarizing other people's work when you're working with the blackouts method? I mean, it's not the same poem. It's basically when you're doing that, you're, you're just um, limiting your vocabulary. Um, I don't know that anyone would recognize what my source was. You know, you can make a sonnet from an article you found in the newspaper. I don't think the journalist would call you up and say that. Right. Plagiarized, so. Right. Um, can you show yeah, us the, do you have the plagiarism? Yeah, pla the original? Yeah. Plagiarism also, isn't it? It's trying to say you are the source of this work. And I don't mm -hmm. think this work is saying that. It's not right. confusing the source of the work. Right. Maybe that's copyright infringement. John could speak to that. Well, somebody else posted a link to the method of blackout writing. So I would, I would direct everybody to kind of scroll back in the chat if you're interested in learning more about that and how it is used as sort of um, inspiration to create your own poem as opposed to copying somebody else's. So um, that was a very interesting link and I thank Katie for posting that. Um, but yeah, if you have the, um, if you have the original, that would be great. If you don't, I have another question while you're looking for that one. Um, what is the commercial market for poetry? Oh yeah, we're just this running. In. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is it, you're, you're in it. Yeah. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, uh, kinda. Kind of not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had a dream once. There's this great, um, there's the, I had this vision one, dream, vision, I don't know what it was. I was living in Las Vegas and there was this beautiful old pharmacy that was like close to Las Vegas Boulevard and it was called White Cross. And uh, you would go into White Cross and you could get like malted milkshakes and like cheese sandwiches and things like this. They, they had like wood paneling on the walls. It was like totally from another era. And at the counter, there was this uh, revolving display and they would have like little booklets and they usually had to do with Vegas. And I lived there at the time. That's where I got prescriptions filled and everything. But I always just thought how great it would be. And I don't know if this would actually be great, but I, it, it, it occurred to me at the time that it could be that if you could go to your local pharmacy and there at the counter where they have like the candy you probably shouldn't eat and, and the tabloids that they would have like, the Vita Nuova from Dante or like Maggie Zerowski's <laughs> latest book. And it would just be like there, like, like some, some company would have, 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 have like paid enough money. And I just think somebody will have money falling out of their pockets and just be like, yeah, okay, that's 10 bucks. I'll get that. Why not? And, and, and I just think some, someone needs to get the poetry into pharmacies. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's the commercial world of poetry in my mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, Amazon uh, slouches towards Bethlehem. Um, I know. I know. I was just thinking Bezos could do that. Yeah. Uh, so some of us who are press, when we put out a book, we just see, we try not to lose too much money. Basically. <laughs> That's kind of our goal. And as long as we can do it and not run out of money altogether, we'll keep going. I think uh, the only book that we published that made money is Erica Hunt's book. It sold everything. Um, but it probably was a break-even venture. So it's not really why you do it. In fact, I used to write screenplays for a little while. And I, I that was awful. It was all about trying to make money. And this is, um, I kind of got back into poetry because there was no, no danger of making a lot of money here. No, it wasn't about that. Yeah. 
Anybody, anything else to add? Maggie, do you have anything? About money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me about money. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll let everybody go for the day. Um, has, has a poem, one of your own or someone else's, ever humbled or frightened you because of its power? And if, if that has happened, could you share the poem with the people watching? Hmm. We're like, no. Uh, <laughs> the question is, have we ever listened to a poem that frightens us? Frightened or humbled you or it just had to, gave you a po such a powerful reaction. Have you ever heard of the poet Joseph Donahue? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, sure that's, Father that's, Joe. Father Joe. Just, just follow him around. Uh, we want to see what it's supposed to sound like. That's what it's supposed to sound like. So yeah, uh, it's like whenever I hear him read, it's like this moment of feeling uh, language is alive and you want to go do the thing. And then also, uh, well, crap, you don't beat me to it. Um, so, so yeah, the sublime maybe. Um, okay. Yeah, I stand with that. I, I, I stand with Joe. Yesterday, I don't mean, I don't know if I fell down on my knees of it but um let me see if i can yeah this poem came up yesterday um it's by julie carr um and i i just was in awe of it because i couldn't ever imagine writing it um just because my my lines don't move that way um and it's it's called a, a 14 line poem on healing one, I cannot freeze sound. Two, or collapse phantom scaffolding. Three, I open one contradiction after another. Four, they call this erotic intelligence. Five, or emptiness. Six, where have you gone in your red dress? Seven, your limbs only ever benign. Eight, a soft belt of air. Nine, wraps or whips your waist. 10, rose, iris, baby's breath, azalea, 11, geranium, heliotrope, hydrangea, 12, everything concerns the habitus and those who live there, 13, so blow a gener generative swerve into remote tongues, 14, softly interlocking. Oh. I don't know if that did it for you, but it did it for me. <laughs> cool. I've written poems that have scared me that I can't believe I wrote them and they were awful. So yeah. I'll say that I've never written anything that I've, that I've humbled myself. Um, I've certainly read a bunch of poems that I just am blown away by and go back to. That was one of your other questions earlier of, you know, who you go back to. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I think, I think I've been really focusing on contemporary poetry because I was never, that was never offered when I was at Auburn. It was always the classics and the stuff we were supposed to read. And it's really nice. One of the great things about poetry and the community is you get to know some of these poets and meet them, and hang out. So that's been great. The, the, all the writers at Duke, Nate Mackey, Fred Moten, Joe Donahue, were just available. And you just got to watch them do it. It was great. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone again for coming and speaking and reading today. And thank you for the people who are participating in the audience for stopping by to watch. This is only our second virtual program for the Friends of the, of the Edgewater Library. And we are really grateful for all the um, support we're getting from the community. Um, if you have a minute before you leave, um, just let us know where you're signing in from if it's not Chicago. We're just kind of interested to see where everyone is um, around the world. Um, I want to again say thank you and it's been a great afternoon and I hope everyone continues to be well in this time. Um, take care everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you friends. <laughs> thanks everybody. Thanks. Yeah thanks for coming. Are we leaving now too? Yeah. We leave now. It's over. Yeah. Yes. Ready? <laughs>